Welcome to our fourth course on the blockchain revolution. We've been through quite a journey together. We've covered a lot of turf. We've seen a lot of big ideas, case studies, new business models. We thought about strategies. We thought about implementation challenges. We've looked at the big picture on regulation. We've tried to understand how this technology is part of some huge changes in society, requiring a whole new social contract. Now's the time to get serious. We're going to bring it all down to earth where the rubber hits the road and enable you to conduct a blockchain opportunity analysis. We're getting concrete here. The goals of this course, the final of four courses, are twofold. One is for you to identify a specific need or problem in your chosen industry that can potentially be solved using blockchain technology. And two, it's for you to investigate possible solutions to this problem, including how these solutions might be executed. You've got the knowledge to do this, but now we're going to equip you with the know-how and the actual technique to move forward. As an outcome of this course, you'll produce something we call a blockchain opportunity analysis. You'll accomplish different project milestones each week. This entire course has been designed to walk you through the process to help you build and improve upon your ideas for the final submission. First, you'll analyze an industry and identify a problem that shows promise for the application of blockchain technologies. Next, you'll brainstorm ideas or applications for blockchain technology within a specific market segment and use a decision matrix to select the most promising idea to focus on for your project. Third, you'll position your idea explaining how it will create new value for customers. And finally, you'll plot out your execution strategy, identifying the business model decisions you'd need to make in order to bring your idea to fruition. We'll walk you through several tools that entrepreneurs use to organize their findings. First, there's a template for analyzing industries. We're, we're introducing a new resource to help with your analysis. We're calling it the Blockchain Case Commons. We put a lot of work into building this. It's a repository of blockchain use cases. And it works like this. When you're doing your industry analysis, you'll likely come across some great examples of people using blockchain to solve specific problems in an industry. And we've created a place for you to share these examples and to collaborate on research with your classmates. Here we're interested only in actual applications of, of blockchain, not in thought experiments or opinion pieces. For example, if I were interested in blockchain for peer-to-peer -peer payments, I might add links to nanopay.net or mpesa.in. The case commons is not for general resources about blockchain. Okay, so that's the blockchain case commons. Next is the decision matrix for choosing the best idea to focus on. You'll define the purpose and objectives of your idea, and you'll specify the target customers or audience who will benefit from your idea. You'll write a statement of need and a statement of benefit for your idea and you'll position your idea so it's clear how it will create value for customers. Finally, you'll write a statement of primary differentiation for your idea. As you can tell, there's a lot of writing in this course. There's also a lot of peer reviewing, but we've provided the rubrics for peer review at every stage. The course is all about collaboration. Then you'll work with a business model canvas. That'll help you assess the feasibility of your ideas, such as the 
funding needed, the risk involved, and the cost structure and revenue streams. You'll describe what you would need to change in your organization's current way of operating in order to pilot your idea, or how a new organization, startup, would need to operate to launch the idea. Then you'll put all of this work together into the final course deliverable. You'll prepare a final blockchain opportunity analysis in the form of a presentation, either a slide deck or a video. And your presentation or pitch must synthesize all of the elements you put together. You'll be able to use this presentation to pitch your idea to your organization or to potential investors. And the end result may be you make $1 million. Now, seriously, this is a meaty course for sure, but we hope that you'll see that this is a real opportunity to, to use this important knowledge and know-how that you've acquired and to collaborate and to engage as a participant in moving this blockchain revolution forward. So let's get at it. Hello. I'm Don Tapscott, and I've spent my career studying how digital technologies can transform our lives. I've written a lot of books about this, 16 in total, such as The Digital Economy and also Wikonomics, How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything. I'm also the co-author of the best-selling book, Blockchain Revolution, How the Technology Behind Bitcoin and Other Cryptocurrencies is changing the world. As well, I'm an adjunct professor at the business school INSEAD. And we're thrilled to have a couple of minutes to talk to you, to talk about what we're doing and what we hope to do with this course. Hi, I'm Alex Tapscott, and I'm also the co-author of Blockchain Revolution, which was published in 2016 and remains to this day the best-selling book on blockchain, translated into over 15 languages. Harvard Business School's Clay Christensen told us that blockchain revolution is the book on how to survive and thrive in this next wave of technology-driven disruption. Tim Draper, the well-known venture capitalist of Draper Associates, told us that this book has the predictive quality of Orwell's 1984 and the vision of Elon Musk. And Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, told us that the book has had an enormous impact on the evolution of blockchain in the world. That's quite high praise and we're deeply humbled by all of it. So it's clearly got a lot of people thinking about the power of this technology to transform both business and society. Wow, those uh, quotes are pretty humbling. Um, so CEOs and government leaders started asking us some big questions about blockchain. How will this technology transform specific industries? What are the real challenges facing blockchain development today? How can we overcome those challenges? How will blockchain change the nature of the enterprise, the way we manage our companies? What will it mean for government architecture and the creation of services of public value? And how could this technology help us solve some big problems such as climate change? So a couple of years ago, we founded the Blockchain Research Institute. This is a think tank dedicated to answering these big questions. We're conducting the definitive investigation of blockchain's impact on business, government, and society. And overall, we have more than 100 projects underway. This is a big multi-million dollar program. We also developed this specialization of four courses, and much of these four courses are informed by the work that we did in those hundred projects. And much of the work that we have done to date is going to be available to all of you. We're also collaborating with INSEAD and Coursera to share what we've learned thus far, and thus what we think is important for you to know. There are many big ideas we'll cover throughout this specialization. First, we are witnessing one of the largest transformation of assets in human history. 
from an analog to a digital medium. Bitcoin is but only one type of digital asset. And we're going to look at the other six types of crypto assets, the ones that we can create, record, and trade on the blockchain. And this ability to trade assets peer-to-peer -peer on the blockchain without going through a bank or some other intermediary is already disrupting the financial services sector profoundly. We'll look at that and the many other opportunities in the finance industry. Second is the idea of self-sovereign identity. That's about our right to establish our own digital identities. Self-sovereign identities can't be given or taken away by any central administrator. They're enforceable in any context, in person and online, and anywhere in the world. And they let us capture and control our own data and manage our own identities to benefit us and our lives. We no longer need to give up our data to big internet landowners, such as Alibaba, Facebook, or Google, just to use their websites. And we can store our data in a, a virtual black box that moves around with us. And we can sell that data or do whatever we want with it if we choose to do so. Third is the idea of smart contracts. A smart contract is a piece of special purpose code executing a complex set of instructions on the blockchain. It's a means of codifying the terms of a deal in software. Now this could be a business deal between producers and consumers, or it could be a social pact between a government and its citizens. What's important here is this. Smart contracts ensure contractual compliance. They hold parties accountable. The blockchain provides a high degree of certainty as to the outcome of these agreements. Oh, and smart contracts self-execute without the need for intermediaries like banks or governments. And frankly, we've never had that kind of assurance before. Fourth is the idea of decentralized business models. These are business models distributed across a blockchain network, not centralized in a traditional corporation. They can be fully autonomous too, meaning no humans involved. There's big potential for true peer-to-peer -peer models like ride-sharing without Uber as a middleman taking fees. Owners of driverless cars will someday be able to put their autonomous vehicles to work. So even the big disruptors can be disrupted by this new technology. And fifth is the idea of the ledger of things. We're already seeing applications of this new internet of devices and things. Soon though, most transactions will happen between devices and not between people. Consider the smart home. Homeowners are adding smart devices such as thermostats and solar panels, and soon potentially trillions of devices will be connected to the internet, doing everything from driving us around to keeping our house lit to managing our affairs and managing our health information. These devices need to be resistant to hacking. They need to be able to communicate value, such as money or assets like electricity peer-to-peer. -peer. Consider electricity. If you imagine that your neighbor's home is generating energy from a solar panel and you've got a device that needs to buy that electricity, then those two devices need a way to be able to contract, bargain, and execute a payment peer-to-peer. -peer. It's not gonna happen through the Visa network. It can only happen on the blockchain. We've given you a glimpse of crypto assets, digital identity, smart contracts, new business models, and the ledger of things. These are all themes of the modules ahead of you. We're just pleased to be working with INSEAD and Coursera to share all this information with you, and we're happy that you're joining us. If you've got questions for us, then just post them on the discussion form, and remember, Technology alone doesn't solve problems, people do. It doesn't create prosperity, people do. And our hope is that you'll connect with each other, identify your common interests, and let's solve some big problems together. This week's project milestone is about analyzing different industries. Every industry can expect to be disrupted in terms of business models. 
as blockchain technologies begin to change how individuals and organizations do their work. So in this module, we'll explore current applications of blockchain in different industries, and you'll choose one industry to serve as the focus for your course project. You'll research examples of applications on blockchain within your chosen industry, and you'll share your findings with your peers in our blockchain case commons. The case commons will keep growing and evolving, and eventually it will serve as an enormous shared resource of blockchain use cases for all course participants to access over time. So it'll be a resource for you lifelong. By the end of this week, you'll be able to define what is an opportunity analysis and explain why it's important. You'll select an industry to use as the basis for your project, and you'll be able to describe one or more market research approaches that can be used to assess market need within your industry. Next, you'll conduct some preliminary market research to help you identify a specific market segment and explain why your chosen market segment is attractive for blockchain technologies. You'll research your competitors, listing their advantages, strengths, and weaknesses. And finally, you'll investigate the barriers to entry in your chosen market segment, both for you and for other competitors. So go to the discussion forum if you have questions. And for more on how blockchain is transforming every industry, check out our book, Blockchain Revolution. On behalf of my co-author, Alex Tapscott, and our academic partner, INSEAD, thank you for joining us. Let's go. Blockchain has presented itself with a myriad of use cases that we find really interesting at FedEx. Uh, so things like the Blockchain and Transport Alliance have formed now with more than 500 participants in the transportation world and in the, uh, in the actual manufacturing and production world out there. So we're looking at really fascinating use cases with everything from food products and understanding the provenance of something that uh, uh, is claiming to be a free range or organic food product moving through the system to pharmaceuticals and how uh, they would be categorized as they come from uh, pharma manufacturers and particularly in cases where they cross borders. You know, we've seen, for example, a, a very serious situation here in the U.S where opioids, you know, have flooded the system and are causing, you know, chaos in an epidemic way. Well, the STOP Act, which is new regulatory issues from the U.S. government, are saying you have to have provenance, you have to have specificity about any opioid crossing the border uh, into the U.S., about what manufacturer it's being produced for, where its ultimate use is, and so we're seeing very valid use cases that combine manufacturing, regulation, customs, all of those things coming together in a very um, intense way that will push blockchain technology forward. This video will provide a demonstration on how to use the blockchain case commons. First, I'm going to maximize the view just to make it easier to navigate within the app. You can see that there are a few examples listed here. We can sort these examples by popularity, date, or name, and we can also filter them by industry or sector. So for example, if I wanted to see applications of blockchain technology for the environment, I can filter by environment, and I see that CarbonX is listed here. However, for my project, I'm interested in blockchain applications for science and the process of scientific research. I know of a few examples in this area, but before I add these examples to the blockchain case commons, I first want to check and make sure that nobody else has added these already. So the first one I have is called artifacts. So if I type the word artifacts in the search field, 
I can see that another student in the course has already added this example. So I can either like this or add a comment if I choose to do so. The second example I have is for a blockchain-based platform called Orvium. So I'm going to search and see if that example is already present. And it is not. So I'm going to click the Add an Example button and add this example myself. When adding an example, you're given a generic default username, which you can change to your own name or a nickname of your choice. So I'm going to change my username to Elisa. Next, there are two URL fields available, and at least one of these must be filled in order to submit the example. So I'm going to provide the URL for Orvium. And Orvium also has a white paper. They have a few in different languages, so I'm going to add a link to the English language white paper here. Now, if this example that you're adding was one that you created, um, you can check off this box and that'll add an icon to the uh, resource just indicating that um, the developer has added it themselves. So next we provide a name of the example and we enter a description. So the description should be concise yet informative. Next, you can select an industry um, that is most relevant to this resource. So I'm going to select science and technology. Um, however, because this uh, resource is also related to um, scientific publications, I can also check off media and communications here. You can also add some descriptive tags to explain uh, what the resource is or if you have a more specific market segment within that industry that you've chosen. Um, you can add that here. Then you click Add Example, and your example will be added to the Commons. So if you click on the title, it will take you to that resource. You can also click on the white paper icon to go to the white paper. And when you're searching for results, if you, if you click on the tags, you can also see other resources that have been tagged um, with those same tags. As well, you'll be able to see any comments or likes that appear on the resource. As a contributor of an example, you'll also have editing privileges, or you can edit or delete that example, um, but you will not be able to do so on other people's examples. So overall, by contributing to the blockchain case commons, you'll be contributing to the advancement of our collective knowledge about blockchain, which will not only benefit yourself for the purposes of this course, but also future course participants, since they will inherit the resources that were left by previous cohorts of students. If you have any questions about the blockchain case commons, please post them on the discussion forum. When it comes to interfacing with, uh, let's say, traditional companies or the authorities, um, I think it's important to have this understanding that education is uh, important and reaching this shared understanding of what you mean by some words is critical. Because if you say blockchain and you understand something, just as an example, and when you say blockchain, you understand uh, coins, you know, you might not speaking about the same thing, even if you think you are speaking about the same thing. So reaching that shared understanding and being proactive and making sure that that uh, alignment is maintained, I think is key, especially when it comes to these top down organizations where if the top guy does not understand that, then you can count that none of the, the people under is like cascading, like <laughs> failure cascading. And if we look at uh, like how the traditional businesses and how these uh, established players might look at this space, I'd say that instead of treating it as, you know, competitive and um, uh, a threat, 
to look beyond the initial, uh, uh, let's say, self-preservation instinct in seeing it as a threat and also try to identify the opportunities. And a great way of doing that is, for example, the Blue Ocean Strategy, which is a great book. Uh, I would uh, recommend this to anyone, uh, especially since in this space, I feel that the niches and the uh, the branches where this can, can grow are still in the process of being discovered. So it's like this blue, big blue ocean out there that is just waiting to be explored and to be uh, filled with uh, the creative uh, imagination of all, all these people. Welcome back. This module is about the problems blockchain can and cannot solve. It's like having a hammer and learning when and when not to use it. Some problems are tailor-made for blockchain-based solutions, and some may not be suited to them. But as with every new technology, we cannot today predict what new and exciting ways blockchain will be used. Remember, in 1991, the internet was used for email. Now we'll look at what it can do. Also, as we say, the future is not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. So maybe you'll be the one to achieve this new future. By the end of this session, you'll be able to identify the many real opportunities for blockchain technology. You'll consider various opportunities for blockchain within your chosen market segment. You'll learn how to use a decision matrix, which is a simple tool that will help you select the most promising idea to pursue for your final project. By the end of this week, you'll clarify the overarching purpose and specific objective of your project. You'll identify your target customer or audience, and you'll prepare a statement of need and a statement of benefit to include in your proposal. You may find it helpful to go back and review some of the topics we covered in previous courses within this specialization, including what is blockchain, blockchain design principles, implementation challenges, and opportunities for blockchain. To recap, blockchains hold promise to help overcome challenges like the lack of resilience, durability, trust, and privacy of our current system. So let's look at what blockchains can't yet solve. Let's also look at the new challenges they bring and the remaining challenges of distributed ledger technologies in general. Scalability is one of the most complex and controversial challenges of blockchain. The best known blockchain network, the Bitcoin blockchain, and those forked from it haven't yet resolved this issue. Other public blockchains, such as the Ethereum blockchain, also haven't resolved this issue. Even now, they process a low number of transactions compared to more centralized networks, such as the Visa credit card network. Bitcoin processes about seven transactions per second, and Ethereum processes 25 in their current states. This latency or delay in confirming transactions comes from different factors. Some of them are artificial by design. Bitcoin's proof of work and distributed consensus requirements slow down the processing of transactions, but in exchange for greater security. Latency makes most blockchains in their current form not practical for some industrial and consumer environments. Imagine having to wait a minute for a light to turn on while the light bulb negotiates the purchase of electricity from a neighbor's solar panel. Latency comes with the lack of scalability. These are major concerns for many use cases, such as the Internet of Things, as described. The developer community is making efforts to address scalability and latency. Public blockchains like Ethereum and Bitcoin won't help out of the box, so the community is thinking about higher level protocols and solutions. The idea of aggregating transactions is an interesting one. Several initiatives are looking at this sort of solution. The COCO framework batches transactions, so we can process about 1,600 transactions per second on top of the Ethereum network. Perhaps the best known scaling solution is the Lightning Network, built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, where transactions can be passed through each other in so-called state channels. This has the potential also to scale the Bitcoin network dramatically. Transaction costs are another issue. Fees for microtransactions can be high in public blockchains. The average rate for a $1 to $2 transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain was 38% in December of 2018 and it was 3% on Ethereum. So doing frequent microtransactions, like say uploading the new temperature value of a sensor is unrealistic. And the processing power and time required to perform the encryption and confirm these transactions, plus the increasing storage needed to record the ledger, 
and we have systems with more limited uses. Regulatory uncertainty is also an open question. Entrepreneurs are often ahead of regulators, especially if they're creating new markets with unprecedented products and services. This results in legal gray areas. The European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, better known as GDPR, for example, provides the right to be forgotten. This means an individual can demand to have any data about him or her erased from the holdings of a data controller. The right to be forgotten is clearly problematic for blockchains, where transactions can be deleted by design. This might be the most striking example of how regulations are not quite ready for true distribution of power, where no central authority is accountable. But it's not the only issue. The next issue is interoperability. Blockchains have the potential for smart contracts and smart things to talk to one another thing to thing, and not through large centralized platforms like Google or Uber. But for this distributed communication of information and value to work at scale, we need interoperability. Everything must communicate through some common set of protocols. It's far from a given in the blockchain ecosystem. New and incompatible blockchains appear all the time. We need convergence of standards if we want worldwide peer-to-peer -peer and autonomous communication to flourish. Energy consumption is another issue. Not all blockchains are created equal when it comes to energy consumption. The most power-hungry ones rely on proof of work, so each unique Bitcoin transaction carries a large carbon footprint, even based on a conservative carbon emission factor. The pace of change presents challenges and opportunities. Smart contracts, smart cities, and autonomous processes need to rely on proven technologies to last for years without fundamental changes. Experts estimate we'll have to wait about a decade before distributed ledgers reach scalability and mass adoption. We're much more optimistic. That said, it's rare for a field of computer science to develop as quickly as blockchain has. The blend of advantages and challenges for distributed ledger technology means that the design choice is far from straightforward. A few criteria, like potentially better scalability, have yet to be proven, though a great deal of progress is being made. So instead, we should focus on the unique features of blockchain relevant to our use case. Consider five questions in particular. Number one, do we need to rebuild trust? Number two, do we need to conduct multi-party transactions without a costly middleman? Number three, do we have a reason to distribute computational power? Number four, do we need an application to run with no downtime or risk of censorship? And number five, do we need to protect identity and privacy? If we answer yes to all five questions, then blockchain is the only solution. So by the end of this week, you'll be able to tell whether problems are well-suited or maybe not well-suited to blockchain-based solutions, at least today. Up next, you'll use a decision matrix to select the most promising of your ideas for your course project. You know, when you look at use cases for blockchain, it's really important to kind of think of the value that's created in that. So some of the notions of value, you know, happen if you talk to Louis Vuitton, you know, and say that, look, this is product that from its very point of manufacture to point of consumption, you know, has to be kept track of. And so, so you think of high value items and whether it's luxury goods like a Louis Vuitton bag or whether it's high value pharmaceuticals or whether it's aerospace parts that you know, are super critical that they be certified properly and, and go into an aircraft or aircraft engine in a very specific way. Those are all high value use cases. So I think what you have to do is sit back and look at the businesses that you represent and say, what are, what are the high value use cases? I think mundane use cases aren't the place to start any technological revolution. You have to figure out where value is created and where there's some margin for you to work with. Where can you invest in ways that that help you drive uh, better use of the capital and assets that you have rather than, you know, kind of marginal, large-scale implementations to start with.
So Oleg, tell us about Sweatcoin. Sweatcoin is a digital currency backed by physical movement that was created with the purpose of making the world more active. We noticed that we humans, generally, me in particular, struggle with retaining motivation and uh, doing as much physical activity per day as I would love to. And it's quite pertinent that we're filming this in London in the second half of January. Last Monday was Blue Monday, when people give up on their uh, New Year resolutions. So this is exactly the problem that we're trying to solve. We're giving people instant gratification for every step they take and therefore they move more, they are more active, they are happier, more productive. Tell me more about though how Sweatcoin really works. What's this currency? How does it really give me um, instant gratification for moving? It's, uh, it's a mobile app to start with. We had to start with that because the starting point is to uh, identify your physical activity and your smartphone is capable of detecting your steps. So we track that, record it and analyze it with our verification algorithm and what we confirm as genuine physical activity rather than shaking the phone or putting it onto a dishwasher as some people try to do. Then we uh, convert those steps into units of currency, sweat coins. The, you can spend on our app with vendors and partners on products, services, experiences, uh, effectively turning your uh, steps into money to buy stuff. It is a good solution because it's uh, an amazing aggregator. Uh, it is also a good solution because uh, there is no need for trust, an intermediary uh, provider of trust, uh, simplifies processes and therefore makes them uh, less expensive and more efficient and uh, creates all these new ideas about how to connect people and devices uh, in a way that is more optimal for the uh, production and use of energy. We are trying to resolve the issues of complexity that come with decentralization and take advantage of this distributed technology to connect distributed resources in a more efficient way, namely renewables, uh, to create new business models uh, such as a simpler way to track uh, renewable energy issue certificates in trade and eventually reach peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading and transactive grid uh, environment. Tell me more about why blockchain is really key for your use case. So blockchain, the technology has allowed us to provide security and transparency. So transparency in that every single transaction that happens on our exchange is publicly auditable on a, on a blockchain. So as opposed to current exchanges, what happens on those exchanges is a, is a black box. Every time we match a buy and seller, that's a transaction on the blockchain which anyone can go and audit. So it's completely open and auditable. Now, why blockchain in terms of security? So our platform connects a buy and a seller. Now, how do we enforce that the buy and seller will actually transfer? So how do we prevent a case where the buyer transfers his token and the seller doesn't transfer it his? And so the old model is, let's have a central intermediary. We'll both transfer his. He'll verify that we both have it and then switch. What blockchain allows us to do, so blockchain has got a technology called smart contracts. And so it's almost like an if statement. So I can deposit my token into the smart contract, you can deposit your token into the smart contract, and the smart contract knows that if you had A and I had B, and we both agreed to swap A for B, the smart contract, which is a piece of code, can check that we've done that, and then switch the ownership. And this was not technologically possible before using smart contracts which are based on blockchain technology. Tell me more about what's the real problem that your exchange is solving and how blockchain helps you do that. So I think it's really solving two things. Um, but it, in the end, it's all about control, control of your own finances and control of your own data. And so when you use a centralized cryptocurrency exchange, um, you're essentially handing over control of your funds to someone else. 
Um, we can take the case of Bitfinex, Coinbase, any other major centralized exchange. And you're then able to trade with other people, um, sell your Bitcoin for dollars or whatever else you choose. Uh, and at the end, you can withdraw your funds off. So you carry a risk there. First of all, that if that exchange is hacked, you lose your funds, as has been seen by many people. But second of all, that you know, you, if, if you want access to your funds, um, you, you, could, you could be denied for, for whatever reason. It may be that the exchange is offline and, and there's just a, a day delay, but it could also be that, you're, 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 uh, that there's a law, law enforcement investigation on the exchange and they're told to withhold funds until it's complete or whatever else. So ultimately, the reason we wanted to build a decentralized exchange was to give people back control over their funds and their personal data. So you're always the person who's able to, to transact when you want, withdraw your funds when you want, um, and to trade with anyone permissionlessly. And that was what we were trying to bring to the market. Tell me a bit more about your experience with Cypherboard and also why you decided to move on to different roles and challenges. So we started Cypherboard back in 2015. Um, I was already working um, with a bigger, another startup. Uh, enabling payments to go via social networks. So we would work with different banks and uh, enable remittance corridors uh, to send payments via, again, WhatsApp, Skype, Facebook. We quickly realized that uh, a keyboard might be a more ideal way because then you don't need to integrate in all these social networks and you work across all the different social networks altogether. Uh, we were blessed to have INSEAD community behind us. Uh, so a couple of our investors are all INSEAD alums. And uh, it's, it's great. Earlier promise of blockchain and crypto assets was essentially to transfer value from person A to person B across the planet uh, really cheaply. But if we see the buzz has actually inflated the asset prices. So people started hoarding, hoarding tokens and holding them rather than using them to transfer. This has affected us uh, as Cypherboard uh, to lower the transaction volumes because people were holding on to their tokens and not really sending them across. Um, so Cypherboard is still live. Uh, they're still users in the thriving community, but the growth was not there. The transaction volume was not there. What advice do you have for others who are looking to make fundamental innovations in financial services, potentially leveraging blockchain? When someone is looking for the right blockchain for their, uh, for their solution, is to really investigate the existing blockchain solutions available out there in terms of the different factors like privacy, confidentiality, degree of decentralization needed, scalability, because there are currently very good solutions out there. So you shouldn't just pick the one that is most available or the one that you find first or someone suggests. So really do your research in you know, choosing the right product. In this video, you'll learn how to use a decision matrix to choose the most promising idea for your course project. For this session, you'll need a copy of a decision matrix uh, you can work with in real time. So here's step one. List all of the options you brainstorm as the row labels in the first column of the table. Next, list the factors you need to consider as the column headings across the top of your table. These factors could be blockchain design principles like integrity or trustlessness. Other factors could be distributed power, aligned incentives, security, privacy of individuals, preservation of property rights, or inclusiveness. Or they could be more typical technical factors like scalability, latency, energy consumed, size, uh, size of installed base, transaction fees, interoperability, open source protocols, private versus permission networks, and so forth. Okay, good. Now here's step two. Work your way down each column of your table, 
Give each option a score from zero to five for each factor in your decision. Let's say zero is poor and five is excellent. You don't need to give a different score to each option. We're not ranking the options here. We're merely scoring them. So if all of your options are, say, good on a particular factor, then it's okay to give them a, st a score of, say, three. Now let's move to step three. Here you're going to work out the relative importance of all the factors in your decision. Like some factors matter more than others to your target audience. Mark these as numbers from zero to five, where zero means the factor is not important in your final decision, and five means it's of crucial importance, a must have. You can give factors the same weight. Again, this is not a ranking exercise. For instance, the factors of security and privacy of personal data may both be essential to your target market, but the transparency of activity across the network may not be. Okay, now for step four. Here, multiply each of your scores from step two by the values calculated in step three for the product, the relative importance of the factors. This gives you weighted scores for each opinion by each factor. I'll say that again. Multiply the score for each option by the score for each decision factor within each box. We finish up with step five. Add the weighted scores across the rows for each of your options. The option with the highest score may well likely be your best option. But here's a pro tip. Maybe your gut's telling you the top score option isn't really the best score. And that's okay, because this was a process to help you define what's important and what's not. Think about the scores you've given across each row. Think about the weightings you've given each column. Your gut may be telling you some factors are really more important to you than you thought at first. Also ask yourself whether an option with a low score on a factor really belongs on your list. So to sum up, the decision matrix helps you decide among several options where you need to weigh several different factors. Any questions, go to the discussion forum, you can talk. Welcome back. So you've identified an opportunity to solve a problem or meet a market need within your chosen market segment using blockchain. Now you'll work on positioning your idea. You'll carve out a niche and identity for your product, for your target customers. By the end of our time together, you'll be able to explain which aspects of your idea will bring new value to your consumers. You'll describe how your idea will change or establish the positioning of your organization within your chosen market segment. And you'll write a statement of primary differentiation for your idea. Your statement should explain its unique value and how your solution is different from what your competitors offer on a dimension meaningful to customers. Keep in mind the seven blockchain design principles we covered in previous courses. To recap, one is the principle of networked integrity, meaning we can instill trust in the network, even if we don't trust those using it. Two is the principle of distributed power, meaning we distribute control across the network of participants, not just to a handful of players. Three is value as an incentive, an alignment of economic incentives of everyone using your app or service. No individual user benefits at the expense of everyone else. The fourth principle, of course, is security. Security involves not just the lack of centralized servers to attack or crash, it also means using proven cryptography fit for the purpose. And it means understanding why innovations such as the DAO or the Tangle failed. Remember, you don't have to be a cryptography expert. You just need to explain it. Five is privacy, meaning you and your customers. You all control your own identity, period. Six is the preservation of property rights, starting with your own data. Finally, 
For the principle of inclusion, we looked at how blockchain could help us plug in people too often excluded from the economy. Remember, this is a fast moving space. When it comes to the messaging about your idea, there must be something durable to it, like a brand promise or purpose, not tied to the current state of the technology. Do you have competitors in the market? And how do you think about driving competitive advantage and, and winning in this opportunity? Yeah. Um, so in this particular space, I think what we've seen is um, very little execution and a lot of storytelling. So lots of people going to VCs, or in this case, people who invest in ICOs, trying to raise money through a story, which often was nothing more than a white paper, which is kind of like the pitch deck of the, of the new economy. Mm -hmm. um, and what people have done is they've told really good stories. Um, they've raised lots of money for it, but they haven't really done anything. Um, now, you could argue that that's potentially a scam or potentially people just trying to do something and they haven't done it. Um, the way that our competitive edge is defined at, at Keyless is that we believe we can execute. And this is why all four co-founders at Keyless are from INSEAD, because the key problem is not developing something that's technologically novel or cool or awesome, but it's to make sure that it actually delivers value to people. Welcome back. Previously, we've covered different kinds of opportunities to build open network enterprises, either disrupting or displacing traditional centralized models. In this module, we'll explore how blockchain technology can expand on current business models, maybe by adding in a native payment system or a reputation system, maybe supporting a sensor-proof content, secure peer-to-peer -peer transactions, smart contracts, or autonomous agents. An idea may seem great on paper, but executing the idea requires you to look at several business model decisions. You need to think about funding and risk. You need to think about talent, partners, allies, and boundaries between you. You need to think about the timing of critical events. In this week's project milestone, you'll begin to think about what's necessary to transform your opportunity from idea into reality. You'll be able to identify the major risks you'll be facing and the ways that you could address them. You'll define your corporate boundary decisions, what you must do, what you could collaborate with others to do, which assets you could share, and so on. And next, you'll identify who you need on your team and the skills and expertise and experience each needs to have. You'll also describe how you could go about attracting partners to work with your company. So let's start by assessing the feasibility of your idea. We've recommended using a business model canvas You'll find more on that in the recommended readings. Then you'll submit your canvas for peer review. Here are some specific questions to guide your thinking. What major risks will you need to address right away? Those could be market risks, technical, competitive, the availability and affordability of uh, talent, funds. How will you define your corporate boundaries? For instance, Will your company produce everything in-house? Will it partner or outsource some work to external suppliers? Do you need to have employees or can you hire skills as needed? Who would you need on your team to make this idea of success? What kind of experience and skill should each team member have? What steps would you take toward building the right team at the right time? And how would you go about attracting partners and allies to work with your company? The business model canvas provides some structure and, and, and a framework for your thinking about these questions. It covers key activities, key resources, and value propositions to customer relationships, segments, and channels. It also covers your cost structure 
and revenue streams, and there's a role for revenue. So please go to the discussion forum. If you have questions, we'd love to hear from you. And for more on boundaries and business models, check out chapter four and five of Blockchain Revolution. At the moment, we have a mix of startups and corporates who are leading, who are piloting, testing. Uh, we have others who are still learning, uh, but the collaboration level is uh, quite high for companies that are otherwise competitors in the market. Uh, and uh, they will further collaborate. They realize that they have to because the core the core layer of the, the app is, is important to everyone to standardize it, to have something that is reliable and that works well. Um, the current startups, uh, some of them may become stars and uh, very important uh, companies. Uh, some will uh, perish. I mean, that is the ultimate uh, end of, of any cutting edge uh, innovation initiative uh, that we see on the market. Welcome back. So far in this course, you've done an industry analysis and you've selected a specific market segment. You've assessed your competition and you've identified a promising opportunity for blockchain within your chosen market. And you've described how you'll position your idea. You've considered the business model decisions you need to make to transform your idea into reality. In this module, we're gonna pull it all together. That means packaging up all your work in this course into a final project deliverable. This peer-reviewed deliverable should enable you to do a mock pitch of your idea to your organization or even to some potential investors. Remember, there's sometimes a fine line between confidence and arrogance. Research has shown that overly confident people are often the least competent. Their displays of competence are merely meant to mask their own incompetence. So, show some humility and respect for your audience. Do your homework on who could be the right investors. That includes those within your organization responsible for funding pilot projects. Ask yourself, what do you have in common? Why should they give you their money when they have so many other options? And by targeted investors, we mean targeted, not mass marketing, not a generic email blast to all your LinkedIn contacts whose profiles contain a few keywords, know how to engage with potential investors. They might just trust you to engage with potential customers and partners. In your pitch, be sure to explain the problem you're solving, why your solution will win, and why the timing is right. Also, be sure to explain who's on your team, especially their experience. By the end of this week, you'll have combined each of your project milestones into a deliverable worth sharing for peer review. If you have questions, please post them on the discussion forum. For more on the types of people you might be pitching your project to, see the section on the players in the blockchain ecosystem in Chapter 11 of Blockchain Revolution. Congratulations on completing our capstone course on business opportunity analysis. You've done it. You've come with ideas for blockchain solutions and you've scoped out their potential in an actual market. You've received lots of feedback on your ideas and you've given feedback to your classmates. That's what we call peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. You've performed a blockchain opportunity analysis that involved exploring unmet customer needs and problems within your organization or your chosen industry. You've identified a specific need or problem, and you've dreamed up a potential solution or solutions to this problem using blockchain technology. We've walked through the process from brainstorming to a polished pitch. First, you analyze an industry or segment of that industry. Then you identified threats to and opportunities within that industry. Third, you positioned your idea for seizing a particular opportunity. And finally, you mapped out your business model and your implementation strategy. Throughout the process, you heard from experts in the blockchain ecosystem and your colleagues. 
you learned how to use tools that entrepreneurs use to organize their findings. First, there was the template for analyzing industries. We debuted the blockchain case Commons, a repository of blockchain use cases. And that's a resource that will live on, and you contributed mightily to it. Thank you. Future students will benefit from your work and will build on your findings. And ultimately, this will become a critical resource for people all around the world to think about how to move forward in the second era of the digital age. Next was the decision matrix for choosing the best idea to focus on. You defined the purpose and objectives of your idea, you identified your target audience, and you positioned your idea in the market. So it's now clear how you'll be creating new value for your customers. Then you worked with the business model canvas. That helped you visualize your idea and map out its feasibility, such as the funding needed, the risks involved, the cost structure, and the revenue streams. You described what your organization would need to change to pilot your idea, or how a new organization would need to change its operations to launch the idea. And you put all this work together into your course deliverable. You prepared a final presentation. It was either a, a, a slide deck or a video. And you've distilled everything you've learned into a powerful pitch. We hope you feel confident in using this pitch within your organization or to the world. So it's been a meaty course, made all the more so because of your collaboration with each other. In a sense, we've co-created this knowledge together. If you've got any final questions or feedback for us, we'd love to hear that and see them. And please post them in the discussion form. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in our series of courses on blockchain technology. We'd also like to thank our academic partner, INSEAD, for recognizing the importance of this great innovation that's underway. And of course, thank you for all your great questions and comments on our discussion forum and for your feedback on our book, Blockchain Revolution. We've covered a lot of ground in our time together, a lot of big ideas, that's for sure. Um, we've looked at using blockchain to create a true peer-to-peer -peer sharing economy. As uh, Vitalik Buterin of Ethereum said, most technologies tend to automate workers on the periphery doing menial tasks. Blockchains automate away the center. Blockchain doesn't put taxi drivers out of work, it puts Uber out of work. We also looked at how blockchain can free up many financial services from the confines and the domains of traditional old institutions and intermediaries, making way for some real innovation and also competition. And ultimately, that's good for everyone, the end user, me and you. We also looked at how immutable ledgers help us preserve property rights and hold institutions more accountable for their actions. And we've walked through the mind-boggling world of smart contracts, autonomous agents, and distributed autonomous enterprises. We glimpsed into the future on how intelligent software could take over the management of an organization and many resources and capabilities in these new forms of enterprise. It may even displace the corporation as we know it. We'll see. We also looked at how blockchain can help supercharge entrepreneurship in many important ways. Perhaps the most important is access, access to the global economy. That means greater access to new sources of credit and new funding, to be sure, but also to new suppliers, new partners, and new investment opportunities. We believe that no talent or resource is too small to monetize on the blockchain. We've also looked at how blockchain platforms are enabling an internet of things through a ledger of things. 
Furthermore, these platforms in a supply chain create what we call a shared network state. That's more than having the same data at the same time. That's having the verified and immutable data that machines need to collaborate and transact. Things will be able to reconfigure supply chains and production processes matching supply and demand. We also looked at how blockchain technologies can change what it means to be a citizen and what it means to take part in the political process. That included voting, accessing social services, and holding elected representatives accountable for their campaign promises. Well, there's one radical idea. We looked at uh, dozens of initiatives enabled by blockchain too. They range from privacy, security of personhood, environmental sustainability, to healthcare, education, and economic inclusion. These are the earmarks of a more prosperous world. Yes, and prosperity, first and foremost, is about everybody's standard of living and quality of life. We all need tools and opportunities to create material wealth and give ourselves an opportunity to move up in the world. That means access to some form of basic financial services. It also means the protection and enforcement of land titles and other assets that are passed down from generation to generation. We've given you a sense of a future where there is opportunity and prosperity for anyone and for everyone. It's a more open world where everyone can contribute to our technology infrastructure and everyone can participate more directly in the economy and in the global economy. That's the promise of blockchain. But like every major transformation in human history, this is going to require leadership. Remember, the internet took off because of the common interests of a diverse group of key stakeholders. They were companies and entrepreneurs, but also members of governments, civil society organizations, and people like you. And leaders in these areas stepped up to join in the governance of the internet. We looked at the key governance areas, the need for standards, policy, advocacy, training, and education. Blockchain, we need watchdogs to drive public debate and boost transparency and hold companies accountable. Indeed, this new paradigm is gonna require new forms of leadership. And these leadership opportunities are available for you to participate. It's a great time to share your ideas in discussion forums online, like Bitcoin Talk or Reddit or Steemit, just to name a few. But there are also ways for you to get involved in your local communities. Every single day, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of blockchain meetups happening all around the world. Find one in your area, show up, and voice your views. So congratulations on completing these courses. You've studied what blockchain is, how it works, and why it's a platform for promise and for prosperity. You've shared your own creative thinking about the technology, and you've done your own industry research, too. So thank you for contributing use cases to the Blockchain Case Commons. And thank you because you've come up with some great ideas for pilot projects. You've learned how to use a decision matrix to compare and contrast these different ideas. You've identified the business model decisions that would need to be made to bring your idea to fruition. And you've done a peer review of your classmates' work. It's that level of engagement that we need right now. If we steward this technology well, we'll fundamentally change what we do online, how we do it, and even who can participate. If we get this wrong, not so good. The technology could contribute to existing problems. It could become a tool for the wealthy to prop up their wealth. Or it could, worse, become a platform for some new kind of surveillance society. So rather than predicting a blockchain future, we're advocating for it. We've argued it should succeed because it could help us usher in a new era of prosperity. We believe the economy works best when it works for everyone. Ultimately, our message is about prosperity for all. Working on the specialization has been a great experience for both of us. As someone once said, if two people agree on everything, one of them is unnecessary. And uh, 
you know, we've challenged each other daily to test our beliefs and assumptions. And I think the specialization is the result of a, a very intense and very positive collaboration. So we do hope you find what you've learned to be important and to be useful. Best wishes to all of you for success in your blockchain adventures and endeavors. Good luck. And please check out blockchainresearchinstitute.com to access our latest research and to continue the conversation. There's so much more to learn and so much to be done. Thank you.